afternoon, everyone. Does everyone have a headset? So the PA system in the room is through the headset? So you'll need headsets to hear. Are we ready? Is the audio ready? Is the audio ready yet? It, it is working. Okay. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, bearing with us with the scheduling changes because of the opening session this morning. But my name is Karen Rose, and I'm Senior Director for Strategic Development and Business Planning at the Internet Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Workshop 159, Strategies for Expanding IXPs and Other Internet Infrastructures. Our aim for this session is to focus on the strategies and factors needed in catalyzing robust internet infrastructure environments and content ecosystems, including the key role that internet exchange points play in growing the internet economy. Past IGF panels related to internet exchange points have largely focused on exploring what IXPs are and, and engaging in dialogue about issues related to their setup. And as Bill Woodcock noted in the enhanced cooperation session on Monday, those panels really produced concrete outcomes, those past IGF panels, particularly in helping to connect those looking for how to establish an IXP with those willing to help. And it also helped spur collaborations by organizations such as Packet Clearinghouse, Internet Society, the regional internet registries, other IXP operators around the world, and many others with helping local communities to actually set them up. I really think we can chalk this up to a clear success of the past IGF discussions on this topic. And for our part at the Internet Society, those previous workshops helped shape our interconnection and traffic exchange program, uh, which we conduct in a number of regions around the world. So this panel today represents an evolution of those past IGF discussions. And our goal is to help put IXPs in the larger context of promoting broader growth in the internet economy, including internet infrastructure growth, investment and deployment, and maximizing lessons learned around the globe. As such, for this panel, we're going to be aiming to move the discussion around these issues from beyond the technical. So we can broadly cover IXPs, other infrastructure issues, government policies, market strategies, and a range of issues related to promoting and developing the internet economy. A number of the areas that we aim to discuss on the panel today include providing an overview of the progress that's been made in deploying IXPs and other internet infrastructures worldwide, and discussing the challenges and gaps that remain, real-world experiences in deploying IXPs, uh, such as in Africa and those lessons learned, uh, and Asia, technical, economic, and policy strategies for promoting the deployment of internet infrastructure and establishing a sustainable market and thinking ahead and sharing thoughts about solutions for overcoming barriers. We're really lucky today to have uh, uh, world-leading experts in these areas. And by way of introduction, uh, we have Michael Kende, who's a partner at Analysis Mason, a global consultancy and research company specializing in telecoms, media, and technology. Bill Woodcock is a researcher, is research director of Packet Clearinghouse, a nonprofit organization dedicated to understanding and supporting internet traffic exchange technology, policy, and economics. Fiona Asunga, Chief Executive Officer of TESPOC, the Telecommunications Service Providers Association of Kenya, 
which is the managing body of KIXP in, in Nairobi and the IX in, in Mombasa. We also have Paul Wilson, Director General of APNIC, the Regional Internet Registry for the Asia Pacific region, and Martin Levy, Director of IPv6 Strategy at Hurricane Electric, a global network provider that participates in a significant number of IXPs around the globe. Um, let me just go over the format very quickly. In order to provide maximum opportunity for interaction, each of the panelists are going to provide a short opening statement of around eight minutes, and then we'll jump directly into discussion. So to kick things off, I'd like to go to Michael Kende. Uh, Michael, you've done a lot of work looking at the economic benefits of Internet Exchange Point and factors that influence their growth. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the positive economic uh, impacts of IXPs and what challenges you see remaining in catalyzing their effectiveness in the broader Internet economy? Sure. Uh, too much feedback. Thanks for the uh, introduction and thanks for the opportunity to speak here on this topic. Can everyone hear me? Um, so today I want to talk about IXPs and for me they're really a critical part of the Internet ecosystem. Um, and the in internet infrastructure in countries. Um, and I'm going to base this talk on a number of papers I've done recently on trends in how uh, internet companies are interconnecting with one another, and a recent paper for the Internet Society on the that, that measured the specific benefits of IXPs in Kenya and Nigeria. And in addition, my company has worked to help a couple countries set up their own IXP to try and get the benefits I'm about to discuss. Um, so IXPs originally um, were formed to, to eliminate tromboning. Um, now tromboning, um, as an example of this, uh, in the early days of the internet, the commercial internet in England in the mid-1990s, there were five ISPs. Uh, most of the content and users were in the U.S., so all the ISPs had to have connections to the U.S. Uh, at the time, the market wasn't liberalized in, in the UK or in Europe, so it was very expensive for those ISPs to connect with one another to exchange traffic. So the result was that these five ISPs all used their international connections to the US to exchange all their traffic, including domestic traffic. So I could send an email to someone across the street, and that would trombone through the US and come back to the person across the street. Obviously not very efficient um, and ultimately quite costly. So the ISPs, including the incumbent BT, got together and set up the London Internet Exchange um, in 1995, I think. And in there, they all met and exchanged traffic in the same building using one link to get to that building and exchanging all their domestic traffic there. Um, and then those IXPs started to grow in Europe, they started to become regional as, as the barriers to, to cross-border traffic started to fall with liberalization, and then IXP, the concept moved from Europe to Asia, and now it's the, the biggest growth in IXPs is in um, Africa and Latin America. And the benefits, I'll talk in, in general, Fiona here can talk more specifically about the benefits we found in, in Kenya, and then they're also in the paper that we did for the Internet Society. But the first and biggest benefit and most immediate benefit of an IXP is that it eliminates tromboning. It eliminates this sending all traffic abroad to come back to the same country or to the same region. And that lowers costs. You're not using expensive international links to exchange traffic. It uh, reduces latency um, because it's, it's obviously much quicker to send, keep the traffic within the country and it makes the internet more resilient because you're not relying on a lot of hops around the world to send your traffic. So that's great. A first immediate impact with a very small investment in an IXP where everyone can exchange traffic. But in recent years, the trend has been that um, these are really growing importance because content is now increasingly portable. What that means is up to 98% of internet traffic now consists of videos, web pages, and other things that can be moved from where they originate and stored in caches or servers all around the world. Um, and the result of that means that once an IXP is established, content providers will move their caches 
or their servers closer to it to be able to deliver traffic more quickly to the end users that are using uh, that, that are connected to that IXP. So this has great impacts. Uh, it further lowers the cost of getting traffic because you're not getting YouTube pages from another country. You can get them domestically or any other uh, pay video. Um, it also not just lowers the cost, but we found in this study that it can increase the revenues for the simple reason that um, if you're, if you're ev we all know if you're downloading a video and it takes too long to download, you'll just stop and do something else. Well, when the video suddenly starts moving local, you can access it quicker and more people will download videos and other content. And in a lot of countries, you pay per megabit for the download. So actually, revenues can go up as a result of this IXP with more traffic. Another great benefit, uh, we've found that governments start to use access to the IXP to deliver services, um, whether it's educational or tax or other services can be delivered through the IXP. And a good IXP can, can also become regional, um, can, can start to gather traffic from neighboring countries. Um, and so it can grow and then you build up critical mass because people, more and more people put their content near the growing IXP and then it grows even further so you get a nice cycle going. Um, so these are all the positive benefits of, of an IXP. Um, further down as people start to invest in content you'll start to get jobs and more revenues that come from that. Uh, there are of course a few challenges. Um, in particular, when you try and set up an IXP today, uh, it can be challenging because uh, a lot of times the incumbents now view uh, joining an IXP as, as, as uh, threatening their, their revenues. They view IP transit, the sale of transit, sometimes as a revenue gathering, and they don't want to peer and interconnect um, at the IXP, so it's very challenging to get an inter incumbent to join. Back in the 90s when Link formed, uh, it's likely that no one at BT was thinking about the revenue implications and they just joined because it's a, it's a nice solution to an engineering problem. Um, so that's the first challenge, getting the incumbent to join. The second is uh, relates to infrastructure. Um, we know now that there's a lot more submarine cable into Africa going to Latin America. Um, but to, you still need domestic capacity to get to the IXP. You need uh, domestic fiber to get across border to the next country. And sometimes that's not fully liberalized and that can raise the cost of using the IXP. Um, and actually we're, we're working on a follow-up to the first in Internet Society study focusing specifically on these cross-border and domestic fiber issues. And, and that will hopefully come out later this year and be available through the Internet Society. Um, but in closing, uh, I would submit that there's really no more cost-efficient way to improve the, in the infrastructure of the Internet in a country than to set up an IXP. Very low cost, um, and, and it can bring significant benefits for the end users, the content providers, the IXP, and others that take advantage of it by lowering the cost of delivering traffic, increasing the revenues, and helping to build an internet an internet economy in the country. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, now we'll go to Bill Wood Woodcock. Um, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about the recent growth of internet exchange points around the world and, and where they're growing fastest? And also, um, you've sometimes referred to IXPs as bandwidth producers. Could you tell us a little more about that? Sure. So. Um, Internet exchange points are where internet bandwidth comes from in the same sense that farms are where vegetables come from. Um, internet service providers move the bandwidth from exchange points to the consumers, uh, but they're not capable of producing internet bandwidth on their own, right? Because the bandwidth, the internet bandwidth, is the ability to get to the rest of the internet, not just other customers of that ISP. So. In that sense, all internet bandwidth comes from an exchange point somewhere. What's interesting is whether it's coming from an exchange point that's near you so that you get good performance and 
the packets are nice and fresh, uh, low latency, or whether it's coming from an exchange point in a different country, right? Imported at high cost. Um, so in that sense, as Michael's pointed out, this is something that's necessary as an economic development measure for every country, right? To become autonomous, to be able to produce its own internet bandwidth. Um, the question of where the internet, where internet exchange points are growing most rapidly uh, is a statistical question, and there are several ways of, of looking at that, several ways of measuring that. The two primary ones would be in either absolute terms or in uh, relative growth terms, right? So either we can look at where the amount of bandwidth being produced is more larger than last year, or we can look at where the amount of bandwidth being produced is uh, absolutely larger, right? So we can either look at a percentage of growth year over year, or we can look at a number, an integer quantity of bandwidth. So uh, Michael referred to, ban to growth in uh, Latin America and Africa. It is true that in Latin America and Africa you see high percentage growth rates. This is because, by and large, the exchange points are still relatively small. So if they quadruple in size year over year, this is a big percentage. But in terms of absolute growth, it's still quite small. In terms of absolute growth, where you see the uh, big numbers are um, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, Germany is a fair-sized country with a population of its own that uses a lot of internet bandwidth. Uh, the Netherlands has a much smaller population than Germany does, so even though most of the time Germany is slightly ahead in the race for amount of bandwidth produced, the Netherlands is the world's largest net exporter of internet bandwidth because they consume less than Germany does domestically. They produce almost as much, but they consume something like a quarter as much. So uh, in terms of who is doing the most internet bandwidth production, and exporting it to other countries, it's the Netherlands. Um, in terms of who has the highest year-over-year -year growth rate, it's whoever was most recently started. So that's almost always a tiny exchange point in a tiny country. Uh, where we see the most new exchange points being formed right now is in the Caribbean. So uh, something like six new exchange points underway in the last 18 months in the Caribbean, which is a pretty high rate. Um, where we see the least happening is the Middle East. Um, so uh, if we look across the last 10 years in the Middle East, we had one exchange point in Cairo, uh, then five years ago, uh, one in Bahrain, Four years ago, one started in uh, Beirut, and now one is just getting underway in Dubai after five years of work to get it started, and Qatar is considering getting one going. Um, this is the third time Qatar has entered into this conversation. So um, I think that what we see there is to some degree the level of frustration and patience with importation uh, being there. The Caribbean, I think, got tired of exporting capital to wealthier countries. Um, and that frustration built up, and they decided we need to be able to do this for ourselves. We're tired of sending cash to the US and to the UK. Um, in the Middle East, I think there is a much greater feeling that the amount of money involved is negligible and you know they've got plenty of money so they may as well just ship it all to Europe and not think about this particular issue. That seems to be the reason, the main reason why this has been um, the slowest growing region. Um, one of the things to, to change the topic a little bit that uh, I've been asked to talk about here is the results of a survey that we did now um, almost two years ago that fed into an OECD report 
uh, on carrier interconnection, that is the terms under which ISPs interconnect with each other at exchange points and elsewhere. And um, the, the sort of interesting outcome of that was that 99.5% of the interconnections between networks are made on an informal basis, that is, without a written contract and signatures. Half a percent have a written contract with signatures, and half of those have asymmetric terms. That is, only one quarter of one percent of all of the internet interconnections have terms where you couldn't just reverse the two names of the parties and have exactly the same agreement. That is, one is paying the other. Um, so if you think about what a regulator can do versus what the industry has done for itself, there's no regulator in the world that can regulate globally. There's no regulator that could regulate 99 and a half or 99 and three quarters percent of all of the world's internet networks. So first of all, nobody has that, the scope that would be necessary to get that degree of agreement. Secondly, there is no regulator in the world that finds its regulated parties 99 and a half percent in such agreement that they don't even have to negotiate terms. So I think those, those two findings, that industry has arrived at a degree of uniformity in its understood terms and conditions, and that there is no way that government could arrive at as uniform a condition, has really led people to a new understanding of the degree to which internet self-governance is successful. So anyway, those are just the things I was going to try and get across. Great. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, and Fiona, um, what are some of the challenges that had to be overcome in establishing and growing KIXP and the IX in Mombasa? And what's the evidence of the broader effects the IXP is having on the internet economy? And how do you explain that value proposition of an IXP to stakeholders? Um, a lot of uh, start by just mentioning the Kenyan Internet Exchange Point has been in existence from uh, the year 2000. And to date, we have uh, 38 members sharing at the Exchange Point to pretty, pretty much all the licensed operators within Kenya. And uh, we are established as a non-for-profit entity, and therefore we charge, we run our operations charging uh, fees for uh, peering, which is a port charge. Now, some of the challenges that we have uh, experienced during this 10-year period have included, range from the need for us to set up redundancy for the location, because for a very long time, we had only one pop, and uh, everything was centralized at that one pop. But uh, since 2008, we have managed to put in place other locations. As Karen has mentioned, she talks of Mombasa. But prior to Mombasa, we had to put a redundant location for the main location in Nairobi. So we have two points in Nairobi and a third point in Mombasa. Uh, we've also had to uh, ensure that we are adding value at the exchange point to the different operators who are peering at the location. And that, I can say, has been a big challenge because uh, we, we try to keep the costs low, yet at the same time ensuring that there are a lot of other value add services we are running, such as the uh, domain name root servers, the security applications, and being able to give reports to peering members on the st status of their network. We also keep maintain measurement tools that are ab that are able to provide details of what kind of traffic is going through the exchange point, and being able to maintain all these services so that then the member is able to see the the member who in this case is the ISP is able to see the value has been a challenge. Then again, trying to grow the traffic, and what we have done is try to work as closely as possible. First of all, with uh, content managers or content providers, the likes of Google and Akamai to see how to bring 
their, the content to the exchange point to host the servers locally so that then that content goes to the exchange point. We've also made an effort of negotiating with transit providers so that the transit providers are able to give subsidized rates to the content providers for them to bring their traffic, uh, the content to the exchange point. The other challenge we face is that a lot of local websites are not hosted in Kenya and therefore there's still a lot of uh, traffic that has to go out coming to Europe where the servers are hosted and back to the country, which beats then the purpose of the exchange point. And so there's a, lar there's a large awareness program we are running with the uh, government to be able to bring this uh, content to be hosted within uh, the country. The other has been the, the need for us to be able to just have a steady infrastructure within the country. There are lots of issues around infrastructure deployment and these have ranged from being able to get appropriate transit between the different locations at a subsidized cost then the other challenge is that a lot of the infrastructure is within the cities. When you go to rural Kenya, there are areas where you can't get any communication. So then that beats the purpose of us being able to have an exchange point because then within those locations, traffic has to go out of the country and then come back in. But the regulator and the government are putting in place a universal access program that should be able to fill in those gaps because with, an, uh, with a suitable model, then we'll be able to have more traffic coming into uh, the exchange point. Uh, the other, which is not a challenge, is the benefits that the exchange point has uh, provided, and these are in terms of reducing the cost of transit between end users, in terms of customers, the emails are faster, communication is faster. Then there is the benefit of uh, reduced cost amongst the ISPs for their international capacity because it's now been skewed by the traffic that comes into the exchange point. The speeds of connectivity right now are high since the landing of the submarine cables. We have seen the traffic uh, uh, speed of uh, accessing sites imp in improve from uh, about 1.2 seconds to as low as 60 to 80 milliseconds to access the s uh, say a, a CNN website in the US or something like that. Then and we've also seen that uh, there's been more appreciation within government for the services we offer and we've seen the Kenya Revenue Authority, for example, bring their, sub their system for collecting revenues from both the uh, customs agents and from the general public to the exchange point, and that has made our traffic in in increase exponentially because then every Kenyan who wants to file any revenue returns does it through their uh, respective IS IS ISPs, and that comes into the IXP and into the from the exchange point to the KRA uh, up, uh, system and the other challenge we have had is uh, an, an issue to do with this regulatory but it's something that hopefully will be resolved by the uh, first quarter of next year and that has to do with uh, regulations and licensing and uh, we are trying to have an arrangement because we are still a licensed exchange point. I think one of the, one of the few still licensed exchange points in the world. But we are having a discussion with our government around that to have a different arrangement that still enables them to have access when they need to and to allow uh, the exchange points to run independent of all other entities and still give the value add that it provides. On the economic, one of the things that maybe I can mention being that I still have about a minute is that one of the things we've observed is with uh, the deployment of e-government services at the exchange point going online and this traffic coming into the exchange point, we've seen traffic increase substantially. And a case in point is when exam results or exam registration is happening, you can see the traffic go up because all the candidates who are sitting for a particular level of examination have to be registered online. And when the results are out, they are available online and that has helped grow the traffic and with the establishment of the e-government department within the Kenyan telecommunications uh, ministry we are seeing a lot of uh, services now being offered online such as uh, the registration of persons and getting of IDs and uh, passports and this is what is driving now traffic into the exchange so and that adds value to the entire eco ecosystem as a uh, Michael Candy had mentioned in his uh, earlier report, the value can be quantified in terms of figures because 
when you find the revenue authority stating that they collect up to about five, uh, five billion Kenyan shillings a day out of the system, the online system, then that is value that they are getting because the system is fast. And it has gotten to a level where they are so dependent on the exchange point. When we have a power fluctuation like we do in Africa and our systems are all down, we find that the report, the report that goes public is the exchange point was down and therefore there were revenue collections for yesterday were hampered. And that is the level of the impact that HEX is having on the Kenyan economy. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Paul, provide us a perspective from the Asia Pacific, obviously a very diverse uh, region. Um, what are some of the experiences and challenges and, and lessons learned in uh, ISP deployment in the area and their role in catalyzing broader growth in the Asia Pacific? Thanks very much, Karen. Um, IP <coughs> excuse me, IPMIC is um, the IP address registry for uh, the region. We're not involved with, with infrastructure deployment or management, and so we're, we're very neutral in that in the sense of who's running infrastructure or how, but the thing about um, our constituents, our stakeholders, is that they're ISPs, they're the people who need and use IP addresses, and the I it's the ISPs who are also the direct beneficiaries of, of IXPs. And that's a common thing across the across the region, that uh, when, when I ISPs get together with an exchange point, they can lower their costs, and that lowers prices to, to users um, in in Bill's uh, agricultural terms, as he said, you're distributing bandwidth from a central point from the exchange out to the users, but that's happening locally and not by internationally importing the, the bandwidth. Um, I think the common things about, about IXPs that we've probably heard about often enough at IGF before is that the IXP model is one of um, which works best as a association of uh, of mutual benefit by agreeing agreeing parties who are who are agreeing through the IXP to, to collaborate. It's sort of an example of this um, this idea that the internet is characterised by very cutthroat co competition at the commercial uh, level, but but a sort of collaboration behind the scenes at the technical level, which actually helps produce a lot of what we what we all enjoy. It's not it's not that any of that happens in secret. I mean, in, in the case of um, of IXPs, they've generally got very transparent terms and conditions and policies and so forth, but um, but the point is that it is an example of collaboration between uh, entities which are uh, which are uh, commercially competing in terms of the the services they offer. So, in the in the Asia Pacific, we've seen plenty of uh, of IXP start start small. It's a shame that um, Garab from Nepal wasn't here because um, the NP IX uh, started with a with a small grant of. Um, Maybe twenty thousand dollars to to buy a bit of equipment. Um, the the technology required to start an exchange is um, is pretty low tech. It's uh, it's not uh, it's not difficult technology um, by by any in any sense. But what's um, what needs to happen is that a, a group of people need to gather to to get together to understand the value proposition. They need to commit some some funding to actually joining into a, a model that's uh, for the mutual benefit and. Um, you know, so so at the, at the start, at least, a, a, a single non-profit organisation in in the say, the major city or in each of the major cities of a of a country is really the way the way that things start. And after that uh, that model builds and uh, and becomes successful, then you often do get competing exchanges and uh, and private exchanges, for-profit exchanges coming along. The um, the thing that we've seen in our region is because I think there's uh, there's a huge uh, difference in economic circumstances between a place like say Nepal or then compared with South Korea or uh, or Japan or the developed the developed countries is that there's um, there's not one Asia Pacific uh, environment at all there's there's many um, one thing that we've seen emerge in the last few years is the um, is a group called the Asia Pacific Internet Internet Exchange APIX group which is um, which is starting to act as one of these catalysts for information exchange and ex exchange of, of learning ex and experience among ex exchange points. Uh, I, we're a little late, actually, compared with some of the other regions, but the nice thing is that there's other regional models to follow, and so the sort of networking that's happening between the APIX group and Euro IXP and the Latin American IXP group is, is really powerful. The other, the other thing about those groups is that they, they form a network 
amongst the participants that extends far beyond simply the, the commercial or technical arrangements. They tend to they tend to catalyze a local a local community, a local network operator community, often uh, often in the form of a NOG, a network operators group, so called, which is often a very powerful thing for for professional exchange, uh, exchange of learning again and, uh, and experiences amongst a, a local a local community. So I think the the the, the intangibles about um, about ex exchange points do have to do with community building and and an understanding of the value proposition, um, understanding about what the what an exchange point is and what it what it isn't, um, rather than the the technical aspects that we might have might have heard about. Um, uh, here before, so you, know, you look you look beyond that to the best the best ecosystem or the best environment for an, for an IXP to actually become established. And I think uh, the first thing is to make it um, to make it easy and to have few, if any, barriers to the possibility for people to get together in a in a non-profit uh, mutual uh, ma manner at a low cost uh, to to set up something through a, an appropriate um, vehicle. So. You definitely don't want to see licensing of an ex internet exchange point as though it's a, a carrier, to a public uh, a telecommunications carrier. You don't want um, you don't want uh, hurdles in in terms of bureaucratic uh, impediments and so forth. You also, um, I think, we want to see, or what you want to see is bottom up rather than a top down model. Um, uh, there are cases where IXPs have been established by, by government um, initiatives, and uh, in the experience there has sometimes not been so so great. Um, those organisations tend to run a lot more slowly and to change themselves and steer themselves a lot more slowly than something that is absolutely in the hands of the network operators. So th when this environment is changing quickly, and so for instance when the international bandwidth prices are actually dropping very rapidly around the world, the initial idea of, a, of an IXP simply as a, a mechanism to avoid international bandwidth, uh, the balance changes. And uh, and if you had an, an IXP that was uh, was charging for access at a, at a rate which made um, international ba bandwidth actually attractive in comparison, then it's really not doing the job that it's uh, it's supposed to do. And that that actually is a real example. So I think uh, the. The bottom-up model and the the idea that the the beneficiaries and I of an IXP are the ISPs and the other peers at the exchange and the the decision making and the structure should be in the hands of those people is is very much a mandatory prerequisite I think for a for a ex successful exchange point es establishment. I think we've heard plenty here about the catalytic effect of uh, of an exchange point. I mentioned the educational and uh, the the professional networking opportunities that um, that derive. We've heard about the opportunity for content uh, distribution networks, you know, we call them cloud uh, computing services these days, but CDNs that bring their bring their services uh, can bring their services into IXPs um, and provide the um, you know the the ecosystem at a national level of of high speed, uh, responsive, high quality internet services where those those services may not have been involved, I mean, uh, uh, may not have been available. I think we all know that that is increasing the benefits of the internet as a whole to a community. And if we're talking about local content, then I think the um, the government information, the the e government services, are, is almost the the best example of of using an IXP to deliver local services and lo local content very effectively, because those those services are really are by definition uh, local. So I'll leave it there, Karen. Thanks. Great, thanks, Paul. And um, Martin, um, can you tell us why internet exchange points are important to network providers like Hurricane Electric, and um, dealing on the investment side? Do they provide an incentive for network operators to spend money locally and bring connectivity to the country? Well, the quick answer is yes. They they, they absolutely provide an incentive. Um, but let's uh, delve down, pun intended, to the bits and, and, and work out why. Um, there's, there's a whole set of um, of factors that have been talked about, about internet exchange points. Tromboning being one of them, local content um, uh, being another. But I'm going to take you through a journey from the outside of the country in. When we talk about internet exchange points in a country, we can normally look at the benefits inside the country. 
there's actually more to it than that. Um, inside the country, um, I'm going to throw a couple more benefits in and show why they suddenly become valuable in a global sense. Take network engineers. These are the people that truly bolt the internet together. They do it within companies, within side NRO, uh, within inside uh, NRENs if they're educational. They do it inside government entities if they're building networks for government. An internet exchange point becomes a wonderful focal point for local network engineers to understand how to do networking. Far better than just buying an a transit pipe to, to a, uh, a telco above them, to whether in country or out, with very little network engineering required to make that work. So an internet exchange point brings some expertise to the network engineers that interact and cooperation between them because they are peering, because they are doing um, uh, networking operations more complex than just being a customer of somebody else. That expertise and this is one of those things that as you meet engineers from around the world, you realize that the engineers that have had that experience also understand how to go and buy their network capacity from either foreign players or in country with a greater level of, of expertise, a greater level of understanding of the questions of the ability to measure a particular network. So this simple byproduct over and above the movement of bits, the quality of the bits improving, is in fact actually a big win um, inside a country, inside a region, inside a city, depending on whichever way we're looking at this. The interesting point about this is that those, um, uh, those network uh, internet exchange points, the IXPs, also have to exist with inside a quality, a better quality of network um, data center than would normally be thought of for IT purposes. Now, that also brings up subtleties like should a network internet, should an internet exchange point be built in a neutral facility? We can ignore that point for the moment because of where I'm about to go. What happens when an internet exchange point is built is that the local players will hash out some of these issues. They will either hash it out because they know um, players from around the world, um, players like ourselves, um, uh, and ask these questions. And the type of answers they get back are um, the appropriate ones for building an internet exchange point. But the key point of where I want to get to, and talking about this argument about the, the economic benefits and the like, and, and where this brings networks like ours into play, is that if all these steps occur, if an internet exchange point is successful, if an internet exchange point um, uh, promotes the use or the building of an independent data center, if an internet exchange point builds for um, network engineers that understand the, 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 the ecosystem of the global internet better, then you have set up an ability not for um, networks in country just to spend money out of country for, co for connectivity, but the potential of bringing networks, global networks in country to significantly improve the quality of internet. A network provider like us, for example, um, sits with a massive list of places around the world to expand. We're in about 50 places at the moment, and it's a natural uh, progression of a commercial company to look at where would you expand next. Sometimes in your backyard, but sometimes you go and add a new country to your map. And those countries can in fact actually, when you finally look and see what's happened over the years, those countries, the growth of internet, the building of massive amounts of bandwidth, has nearly always been related to where internet exchange points have been placed and have become successful. The marketplace grows, the uh, ability to find independent data centers grows, the internal push from the country has made it palatable for external countries, uh, external companies from external countries to look at building. So as we as a network look at um, new marketplaces, as one does, you look at the internet exchange growth, the 
quality of the networks around the Internet Exchange, and that gives you a good idea of where to go. Now, the only final point to add to this is why build into a country versus simply wait for that country to build out and take the money outside. And this is an obvious statement. There is um, a natural um, uh, tendency for um, uh, networks to start off having to buy internet connectivity out to some global uh, hotspot for internet uh, bandwidth. We know those in Europe, we know those in, in Asia, we know those uh, in North America. But the reality is that if they're successful, if undersea cables come into a country um, and actually build gateway capability to further locations, then the IX, the Internet Exchange, will add to the ability for that country to become a gateway, to become a central point, to become something that is fundamentally um, needed and important as we look at the global Internet. So we look very um, um, carefully at new exchanges, both as an interest to see whether we want to join, but more importantly, as to whether they become the new hotspots that, uh, that become a, uh, uh, the next gateway to somewhere else in the world. The Internet is global, and let's keep it that way. Great, thanks. Um, now we'd like to uh, open it up to the floor for questions. And um, uh, while people are thinking of their questions, and as well if there's anything that the panelists want to respond to or comment on based on the opening uh, comments, uh, that would be great as well. Go ahead in the back. Can you get a microphone? Thank you, Karen. Uh, Marco, welcome to Ripe and Sheep. Um, yeah, uh, thanks to the panel for all their wonderful comments. Uh, Discussing this, um, having a local internet exchange can greatly improve your uh, internet access in a local country and recently seen some other nice examples, for instance, in Palestine territory where five operators came together and sort of set up a local exchange. But as Fiona highlighted and Martin also mentioned, is, is uh, the world is bigger and it's also about getting, getting other parties to come to your IXP content providers, transit providers. And as Fiona highlighted, having, having a sea cable landing dramatically improves that effect. It helps a lot. Um, so my question is, uh, what if you don't have a coastline? What, what if you are entirely landlocked? Because being able to access the sea makes getting a, making a cable landing politically much easier because you don't have to negotiate with a lot of parties and also it's relatively cheap. So what in terms of landlocked countries can be done or should be done to basically give them the same advantages? How to extend those submarine landings over land into those countries that don't have a, co um, that don't have a coastline? And in terms of IGF in the multi-stakeholder environment, uh, which forum or which parties should take the lead there? Because it's not that easy as a commercial party to just say, I'm going to take a fiber from country A to country B. Thanks a lot for that question. That's really great about landlocked countries. Um, Michael and Bill? Okay, yeah, that is, a, that is an excellent question. Um, and so, for instance, in Africa, there's 16 landlocked countries. Uh, there's three in South America, um, I think 10 in Asia. So it's clearly a critical issue. And I would say it's not just an issue for landlocked countries. Not every country has one, not every coastal country has one landing station. And some of them only have two. And so getting across borders is important for increasing competition, resilience, et cetera. So I think it's, it's really something that the governments have to focus on first to remove any barriers to being able to build across the border. Um, there's still some of those landlocked countries have a monopoly on the international gateway. So, you know, it's very hard for any, comp for any competitors to try and build out to the, to the coastal country, um, obviously in that situation. And so I think that they have to first, it has to start with the policy that we need to get access there. They're going to have to negotiate with the other government for a right of way through. 
um, and try and get as many redundant and competitive cables through as possible. But the first thing has to be the recognition that they have to get access competitively to those, to hopefully more than one coastal country to be able to access those. And I think some countries are starting to think of that seriously. Um, there's some uh, cross-country um, Pan-African cables coming up, and I think those are going to start addressing the issues. The, um, the fiber doesn't know whether it's going through water or dirt, right? So it's not a technical issue. There are two differences between landlocked countries and countries that have access to ocean. One is the ownership structure of the cable, and the other is the number of pairwise neighbors, right? So a landlocked country may have as few as, well, in the case of, of their countries completely surrounded by South Africa, right? So you may have as few as one neighbor, um, more often two or three neighbors. These are the, the limits of the number of, of pairwise relationships that they can have country to country. Um, and they may have to then chain those together, as Michael said, in order to reach other landing stations or other exchange points or other, internet, other international bandwidth. So maintaining good relationships with your neighbors is really critical if you're landlocked because they're the ones who are your gateway to the rest of the world. And maintaining a regulatory environment that encourages joint ownership of fiber is also important, right? The ownership is the other critical piece here. Um, undersea cables are almost always consortium owned. That means that there are multiple owners who each have shares and um, access to the fiber is generally available in the marketplace. Whereas terrestrial fiber is much more often owned by a single party or by a pair of parties, one at each end, who do not give, who do not sell wholesale access or do not make access available on the same terms that they themselves get it, right? So that sets things up for a monopoly condition. Um, so those are, those are really the two, the two big differences. Fiona? Uh, maybe I can share with you the experience that we've had within the East African region. We have what is called the East African Communications Organization that brings together both the regulators representing their respective governments and the operators of the five East African countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. And of these countries, only two have a coastline. The other three are landlocked. And from 2008, the discussion at that level has been that the different governments will work together to ensure cross-border connectivity. So we have what we call the East African Backhaul System, which is basically a network running across all the five countries. And what we are trying to do right now is to get that network connected to all the five exchange points so that then the traffic can flow within the exchange points or within operators, across operators who are appearing at the different exchange points. Then the other thing that the governments agreed to was that um, any member of the East who does, anyone who does business within the East African community and wishes to peer at any of the exchange points doesn't need to have a license to access the exchange points in the next country. So you can actually, as a Kenyan, go to the Uganda exchange point and be able to peer at that exchange point without need of getting a license to peer at the exchange point. You only get a license when you have to run business within the exchange. So that kind of collaboration is working well and has seen and is what has actually contributed to a lot of traffic growth within the different exchange points because for starters it has seen traffic coming into Kenya from each of the countries and being carried from Kenya to the respective countries and has contributed to the 50% air sends annou announced at KXP that are not Kenyan. Thanks for that. Uh, Fiona, we had another question over here. Can we get a microphone? Is there anybody else in the queue? Anybody? Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Anyway, I, I barely hear myself. Anyway, uh, my name is Maria Hall and I'm working for the Swedish government, the Ministry of Enterprise, Energy and Communication. And and I want to thank uh, all of you in the panel for all the good statements 
actually by, by a few of you by, by expressing regard to before, but I was mainly want to ask uh, what kind of what kind of support the government gives to the uh, ho hold on just can uh, we get another microphone this one I seems to be I cut think out. the question was what kind of support can governments give to exchange points yes what kind of support except for what you mentioned you mentioned the regulatory framework uh, and a few other things you, c you can't hear me up there. The, the microphone is cutting in and out. So, so because I what I understand from Fiona is also, th if I don't misunderstood you, is that um, y the government is also like a customer for, or the agencies are a customer for the for the exchange point. So, just want to hear what else c uh, government could do. Thank you. I think as background for the rest of the audience, it's useful to know that Sweden is at one end of the spectrum of government participation in exchange points. And Sweden uh, has a tighter coupling of government participation with exchange points than pretty much any other country in the world. And that's worked quite well there. But it's a model that has not been uh, left upon by other governments by and large. We had a, a question here in front. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm I'm thinking ahead. Go ahead. Uh, who's in the queue? Um, great. Mm. Go okay, one of the things that the government of Kenya has done to support the exchange point has been to uh, promote uh, the e-government services and ensuring that they are hosted at the exchange point. The other has been to work with closely with the exchange point in setting up some of the value add services that we have sitting at the exchange point, such as the security monitoring and uh, that kind of stuff. But the Kenyan government has not been like, I know the Swedish government did put in funding for the exchange point to get it started. We have not been able to benefit to that level. However, they work very closely with uh, us on uh, different programs we run, including capacity building where the a government institution, the Kenya ICT board, from time to time supports the different programs that we are running. To give another very quick example, uh, in Nepal, um, over the first, I think, four or five years of the existence of the exchange point there, by far the highest traffic spikes uh, were at the end of every uh, academic semester when the government released everyone's test scores, all the students' test scores, and all their, their parents were madly clicking on the reload buttons waiting to see their, their kids' uh, test scores. So there are different kinds of government participation, different kinds of government content and information that can be made public uh, across exchange points, and that is often one of the early large drivers of traffic. And one other thing, the government of Kenya has made sure that if you want to provide any internet-related services to any government institution, you must be peering at the exchange point. So that is a policy directive that has en enabled us to get more members coming to the exchange point, and therefore bringing more traffic to the exchange point. So I've, w I've worked in several countries um, that are trying to set up exchange points, developed or uh, almost developed countries. Um, and the, the biggest frustration is um, typically that they can't get the incumbent to join. And then the, so they can throw money at it. Both of these were countries that had money to throw. Um, so they can throw money at it, they can do what they want, but they'll always typically fall short of requiring peering um, or, or getting involved in IP interconnection in any regulatory way, and I agree with that. I mean, there's a strong tradition of not regulating, and at the end of the day, most of them were convinced that they don't want to be the first country to force peering on the incumbent. Um, but then it really becomes a question of anchor tenancy, getting more content there, providing money as seed money for the exchange, but um, typically without the incumbent, um, it's, you know, it's hard to recreate something like links or um, you know, the other large exchanges without uh, the incumbent's active participation. Sorry, uh, hand over here. Oh, great. Hi, Jesse Sowell, uh, grad student at MIT. I have uh, two questions, and I'll ask the first one, and then uh, we can go to the next one if there's time. Um, 
A number of panelists have touched on the associational membership model, um, describing it as it's, it's been a very successful in Europe and it's uh, being deployed, if you will, in other regions. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if the, un if, if the panelists can unpack some of the differences or variances, variations in this model in the context of other regions. What parts of the model have been successful, uh, just directly applied, and which parts have had to be modified for different contexts? Why don't you give your second question as well, and we'll take them both at the same time. That's fine. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> okay, so they're, so they're, they're fairly different. But um, uh, IXs have been referred to as Internet Exchange points historically, but um, there have been quite a few suggestions that it would be valuable to directly interconnect IXs. So I would like the panelists to in, uh, elaborate their interpretation of what's conventionally known as the non-compete norm and uh, what their perspectives on early instances that are currently in the wild for, the, for this type of interconnection. So I see Bill smiling, so please pick whichever question you like and go. <laughs> Let's take the latter one first. Um, this is a misconception that comes up over and over and has for 20 years. Um, people think, well, if an exchange point is good, connecting two of them together must somehow be better. But think back to the agricultural analogy. Um, do you really need your vegetables delivered from one farm to another farm, or do you need them delivered to people who want to eat them? Um, there, there is no packet in the internet that crosses two internet exchange points, or more internet exchange points. There's no model for that, there's no need for that. So interconnecting exchange points with each other does absolutely no good because there's no traffic that needs to take that path. What you often see is people pursuing that misconception and then finding themselves with a bill to pay for having bought a circuit that was unneeded and trying to find some way to cause traffic to cross that circuit in order to be able to send someone a bill. Okay? So you get these sort of retroactive explanations applied to this mistake. Um, and typically what happens is people say, well, why don't we let people, for instance, in um, Dar es Salaam peer at an exchange in Mombasa by having the Dar es Salaam and Mombasa exchanges interconnected with each other, and then we bill everybody in Dar es Salaam and Mombasa for that privilege, right, thereby covering up our mistake, and we hope that somebody in Dar es Salaam is going to want to peer with somebody in Mombasa. Okay? The problem here is that it creates a new expense, and there is no downward pressure on that price because there's no competition on that link between those two exchanges, and it divides the cost, which now has no reason to go down, between a whole bunch of people who all have equal access to it, but none of them have any inherent need for it. Right? So you've created an artificial um, tragedy of the commons that did not need to exist and has a high price tag associated with it. So uh, essentially, this, this problem has been encountered many times before. It's not significant in the scale of the world, but if you go looking for it, you'll always find a few examples that have not yet collapsed. There has never been an instance of this that has lasted more than a few months or maybe a year or so. Um, people always get tired of paying for a bill to cover up their mistake. So that, that's an answer to question number two. Question number one was about the uh, model, the, the association model. Um, the way you phrased the question made it sound as though this was a minority position that was moving outward from Europe, but in fact, it it is the, the majority globally. Um, there are some commercial exchanges that also exist. Uh, commercial exchanges are more prevalent in the United States, uh, Australia, and a uh, few in, in Europe. Um, the association model is by and large the dominant model everywhere and, and always has been. Um, Equinix is a huge commercial exchange point operator in the United States and operates many of the largest exchanges in the United States, but that is globally a sort of exception. Um, <coughs> I'll hit the first question. Um, 
the reality of building into exchanges um, the actual movement of bits actually seems to have little difference whether it's a member-based exchange or a, uh, a commercial exchange with one key point. If the cost is controlled and is palatable to the local market, then the exchange will win. And when I say palatable, that means that if I look at the cost of building to an exchange in a Stockholm, Sweden, as we were asked a question earlier from there, or the cost of building into an exchange in London or Hong Kong or Tokyo, and I'm picking some big cities for a reason, um, the cost model is quite different, although as I go through those different cities, I in fact go through a member or non-member based uh, environment. The cost of living in those cities will in fact actually have a direct relationship to the cost, whether it be member based or commercial based, because it just costs more to do business in Japan. It costs more to do business in Stockholm than it does in London, and all are more expensive than doing business in New York, at least in the telecom world. This is one of the places where it's quite cost effective, um, et cetera, et cetera. So as you move around, you will see a varied price, but the local marketplace must be palatable for that, independent of whether it's a marketplace, whether it's a member-based or a commercial-based environment. Um, the final point is that, keep in mind, it also has to be contractually acceptable, not with requirements that, for example, in a membership-based organization, there may be a requirement for um, some local um, uh, corporate entity that may or may not exist for an, uh, a player coming from far away. Um, I'm trying to make sure I don't talk about telecom regulation because that's a given within uh, operating uh, anywhere. So I think that, that uh, in, in the big scheme of things it doesn't matter, but um, I think that we've got to stop talking about uh, the European model of membership because it, 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 uh, um, it, it, it's, it's a lot more global than that these days. Just to, to elaborate a tiny bit more, there's one advantage and one disadvantage to operating an exchange point commercially. The advantage is that you can lose money, right? A, a commercial operator can choose to subsidize its operations from some other source for the benefit of, of, the, of the customers, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, th whatever their reasons, right? They can artificially depress, depress the costs of participation and get people in the door. Um, the disadvantage is that they're not protected against acquisition, right? A nonprofit in pretty much any country is protected against acquisition by a commercial uh, corporation, which means that there is no participant in the exchange who can buy the exchange in order to compel behavior on the part of its competitors. Okay, um, maybe we can go to Fiona to answer the question and then we can get to the, the one that's on the floor. Actually, Bill has answered part of it, the first question. And uh, th the reason he said that, th that the, the association model works because the different operators do not want any one operator to take full control of the exchange point is pretty much the reason why in Kenya it had to we had to go with the association model. And that was part of the trust of amongst the operators is a big had played a big role in, in guiding us in that direction. And so far it has worked in the sense that a number of entities actually went and got licenses because we had a license exchange point. They were issued with licenses to run exchange points and some have even set up exchange points but nobody peers there. So they call what they are switched an exchange point, but it has no traffic because nobody wants to peer there. And so the association model is, is what is carrying the day. And it's what we are encouraging our neighboring countries and other entities we meet with to uh, adopt. The second question on the interconnecting of the exchange points. Now, within the East African region, we've had the same argument. However, our governments feel that the exchange points should still be interconnected. And that is why we have the interconnection of the different exchange points within the different countries. But because the operators feel that they should, it should be on a contractual basis based on what value you see at the particular exchange point, we still ask for room to allow operators to go into the respective exchange points directly. And so over the past uh, two years that this has been operating, what is turning out is that operators are preferring the model 
where they go to our respective exchange points because of the different valuers they are looking for, as opposed to the interconnected exchange points. Though there is a circuit that our governments are generously paying for to ensure that there is a pipe that links the different exchange points. Thank you, Fiona. We'll take two more questions and then we'll go to a wrap up. Uh, we're running uh, to our time slot. So we'll have a question, Mohammed. Hello. Um. Hello. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, my name is Mohammed. I'm uh, based in Senegal. I'm an IP expert. And uh, I just want to start with two uh, assessments first. The first one is, in Africa, we have less than 20 countries that have already set up IXPs out of 52 or 54, depending whom talking about the numbers of countries in Africa. And uh, the internet traffic is growing in country even where they don't have internet exchange point. And in many countries they say, uh, maybe we don't need it because we have seen the traffic going and the customer are happy. So it's very difficult to, uh, to prove to countries who are reluctant to set up their internet exchange point, specifically in country where you have an incumbent telecom who is very powerful and who connect, I mean, almost 60 or 70 percent of the customers, and they are um, putting the country in a situation where everybody is just uh, paying for transit and nobody, I mean, is peering with that telecom operator. This situation exists in many African countries. It is just like Nobody was able to convince them that there is a value. There is something they are missing because, in fact, the main argument they put on the table is we don't have an internet exchange point. The internet is growing very fast. We are doubling or we are 300 growth every year. So why do you want us to put these things? I am an, an, an IP expert. I'm trying to push the model in many countries. But, in fact, the opposition we get is... Uh, the chance we have in this IGF meeting is we have these three different actors, those who decide, those who regulate, those who advise, and those who operate. And we need really to show to people what are the real benefits and what are the accelerators that we can show and prove that in existence, if there is no internet exchange point in the country, what they are losing, it is not obvious. And I really beg that you guys can help us show up for countries who are in a situation where don't they don't have internet exchange point, what they are really losing from the government perspective, from the private sector perspective, and from the, 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 the end user perspective. Yep, we'll take a response from Martin and then we'll go to our last question. It, it, it is truly wonderful to, um, to know that the internet can grow without an internet exchange point. But that's a general function of the internet itself as it as it exists, um, but it's a it's the wrong data point. The fact is that if you go out to other marketplaces, if you were to go to East Africa, um, um, if you were to go to um, uh, various places in Latin America, um, the the internet the growth is so much greater when you see an active internet exchange environment. So it's nice to say, hey, the internet is growing, but the reality is. No, it actually should be growing even more than that, um, e even more than you, you think it's there. So your incumbent, um, if you have a single incumbent with inside a country that has this very high percentage of, of control of the marketplace, um, it is in its best interest, quite frankly, to stop the building of an IX. That's commercial 101. It, it's going to happen. And um, I think that's the result you're seeing. Thanks a lot for that, Martin. And uh, one final question, and then we'll have a final wrap-up. Can you hear me? Yeah. One of the key themes of the IGF this year is development. And a quick question for w any of the panelists with respect to the fact that you see the importance of the human layer of development, the physical infrastructure layer of development and governance. 
but with respect to the human capacity development aspects and what an IXP can do to help with that perspective or that element, can you elaborate on that? I know there's a specific amount of training that can also take place when you have an IXP up and running, and what is it that that has done for the, for the local technical community? Great, you want two respondents on this one? Go ahead, Fiona and uh, Paul, or did you have a hand? When it comes to capacity building, in the case of the Kenyan Fintech Change Point, what we have seen over the years is imp an improvement in terms of skills. Uh, when we were starting off, we took one whole year to get started because we had a challenge in terms of uh, the skills we wanted to use to run the exchange point as well as legal and regulatory issues and knowledge of what was involved. And uh, once we got started, we've seen an appreciation by legal and regulatory policy entities on what the exchange point does and the value it brings to the entire uh, setup of the internet within the country. And that has come through in terms of the kind of discussion, policy discussion we have, and the kind of regulations that are now coming through in c when it comes to issues that affect the exchange point. When we talk of, uh, for example, cyber security, because at the exchange point we run a, a, an industry SAT, so then we are able to use the information running on the members, peer in members' network to provide security alerts. And that kind of information is appreciated now even by the government at the national SAT level, by government entities. And it has seen the e-government applications now come and peer directly at the exchange so that you can give them alerts on the kind of content they're bringing in and uh, the status of that content, how clean it is and how vulnerable it is for attack. The other thing is uh, there's been capacity building at the technical level. We've seen a lot of skills being developed because we have purposed ourselves as the Kenyan Exchange Point to learn from other exchange points, particularly the European ones. And there are two exchange points in particular that we are learning a, a lot from terms of technical skills. That is NetNode and uh, AMSIC in NetNode in Sweden and AMSIC in Amsterdam, who give us uh, tec uh, capacity building to the KXP technical team, who then pass it on to uh, the technical staff of our peering members. So twice a year we have training on routing and uh, different routing techniques and n any new routing techniques that you want to deploy at the exchange point. And that has translated into continuous development of skills because it's done on an annual basis. Okay, and from Paul? Just, just a, brief, a brief question that I think um, it, it, it's, really wrong, it's really wrong to see it. Uh, an, IX <coughs> an IXP is a panacea, a monolithic thing that in itself is going to create, create miracles. But I think, as with many things in the developing environment, you have uh, a lot of leverage to be gained by packaging a number of things together. So the community building is really, really important, and education, human resource development is really important. We know that across across uh, all areas of, of economic development. In terms of internet services, the difference between a reliable, fast, secure internet service and one which is opposite on all three dimensions is often human resource and capacity building. So that's, that's a really powerful thing. And anything that can improve and help with, with human capacity building, I think, is a good thing. And the IXP is, uh, an IXP is one. Um, the coming PACNOG meeting that's happening in PNG is actually going to uh, have as, a, as an exercise or a, a parallel activity the installation of, of the first IXP there. And I think that's also a really nice example. If they could throw a root server into that at the same time, it would really create a lot of excitement and, uh, and interest. In um, response to Muhammad, though, I think you know, while not a panacea, the IXP will benefit the people who participate in it. And so if you have a, a number of small disenfranchised IS, ISPs who are not competing with an incumbent and the incum incumbent is, is not participating in an exchange, then in proportion with the amount of activity th that those small ISPs have, the IXP can bring benefits to them. It could bring benefits by, again, attracting a friendly government's uh, e-government services to be provisioned and, and provided through those, those ISPs as well, not to mention other content services. If your if your incumbent is so bulletproof and so uh, imper, 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 impervious uh, that uh, that it makes no difference to them, then you've probably got a different uh, problem in terms of uh, in terms of the the functioning or otherwise of your market. And the I, the IXP is not a panacea for for that, unfortunately, either. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot for that, Paul. 
and um, I, I think this we had a really broad discussion, and I think Jane encapsulated it really well. Um, you know, in terms of looking at um, challenges and barriers um, and opportunities regarding physical infrastructure, um, you know, governance infrastructure, both in terms of government policy as well as um, local governance of people getting together uh, and being able to develop uh, the models for how the exchange point is going to operate and provide value. And we just ended on the human infrastructure uh, a bit uh, as well and how that is both a, a need but also an opportunity when people come together to develop a, a exchange point for I exchanging and sharing their knowledge uh, in the best traditions of the internet, which I uh, think is what we've done here today on this panel. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists and everyone here, and I'd like to especially thank uh, Jeff Brueggemann, who was a co-coordinator of this session and uh, who did a lot of really excellent work to, to bring it together. So thank you, everyone.